This is API Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Like E.T. said. Hello, and welcome to the November-December 2020 episode of API Case Files. I'm Marsha Barnhart, your co-host for this episode, along with our API director, Paul Carr. We're also joined this episode by two of our newest members, Dan and Molly. Dan joined API in September 2020. Hi, my name is Dan. Yeah, I'm an Army veteran. I also have 20 years of experience in IT, and I'm also a licensed amateur radio operator. Dan describes himself as somewhat skeptical of many UFO claims, but also believes that if UFOs are real, then we should be able to find some form of empirical evidence. So he became interested in the research and investigation of this phenomenon. We're happy to have him on the API team. Molly joined us in August of 2020. My name is Molly, and I'm a brand new UFO investigator, and I'm interested to see what a person can do with a sighting and how you can you can look up information like the flight tracker and stuff like that, I think is really interesting. Um, I'm a statistician in my day job, um, so I'm used to following data, and I'm interested to see where the data goes. Molly thinks the UFO phenomenon is something real and that it's better to move on from arguing about its existence to gathering as much information as possible on the subject. So, in the interest of gathering information, the API Case Files podcast provides an opportunity to examine and discuss reports and observations of unidentified aerial phenomenon. In this episode, we will present several interesting reports. Paul starts us off with a case set in Lakeview, Ohio. This took place in the evening, a little after 11 p.m., on Saturday, July 18, 2020. The one that's really been on my mind a lot has been 2030, which is um, husband and wife were sitting outside and trying to look at Comet Neowise. That was last July. Nice, clear, warm night in, in Ohio, and they were. It was a, a little bit after eleven o'clock, and he had uh, an inexpensive um, night vision video camera. It's called uh, the Psionics Aurora, and it's pretty noisy, and uh, the colors are not quite true, but it does see uh, dimmer stars, and you can see with the naked eye no, normally. Uh, So it it is something of a night vision device. And he was trying to get shots of the comet, uh, which if you had clear skies, clear dark skies uh, around that time, you could see the comet quite clearly. We took pictures of the comet and I sat down in a chair alongside of it. And I think it's because of uh, reflection off my glasses. I saw something that looked like a blue beam out of my left side, like my peripheral vision. I looked over and was like, what the hell was that? I, I looked, didn't see anything for a second, then I saw a light in the tree line. Got up and I walked out and looked. I was like, what the hell is that? And I'm just standing there staring at this thing coming. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, hey stupid, get the camera. This thing, it was so, it looked like a welder's art. I mean, it it was like pure white with a slight tinge of blue to it and just super bright. I'd never seen anything like that. So I filmed it, obviously, as you saw in the film. And my wife never, she kicks herself in the butt because she never got up to look. (laughs) She just stayed sitting in a chair and I'm like like thinking in my head, this thing, it, it was beautiful. I mean, I don't know how to describe it, but it was beautiful. Well, uh, you, you said in your statement it came up in the west? It came from the west and was heading east, 
And when I was filming, I was facing south. And then I, I was walking backwards as I was filming because of all the other trees that are here, I wouldn't have been able to see it if I were just stayed in the same spot. We have a lot of data. We know how tall the trees are. He measured them with his drone. Uh, we know how, uh, how far away he was standing from the trees. And so it, it goes, you can see the light coming through the tree. And this is a pretty thick tree. Of course, it's July, so it's got lots of, of leaves on it. So, uh, you, but the light shines through the tree. You can see it. And then it comes out the other side. And it's very, very bright. And because he's using the night vision device, we can see individual stars quite well. And they are identifiable stars. So we know a lot about how this thing traveled and moved as he was shooting it. Where he started shooting, was it was roughly south of him, and then it went until it was a little bit northeast and just went over the horizon. I'm not saying this thing was aliens, but I know what it wasn't. It right. wasn't a helicopter. It wasn't an airplane. In my opinion, it wasn't a drone, although that's the most plausible explanation I can think of. It wasn't the ISS because the times don't light up, and I've never seen the space station that bright. I've seen it a lot of times. And, you know, I don't know what it was. Okay. I do believe in UFOs. I have seen other things before, but nothing ever like that. I damn sure never got anything on video. I don't know what it is or what it was, but I want to know. Uh, the total duration of the video is about a minute and six seconds. And the first time I saw it, I thought, oh, that's an earth grazing bolide. Those are rare. It's really cool that he saw that. But I am absolutely sure when I go on to the American Meteor Society website that dozens of other people have seen it too. Anytime there's a bright meteor, it doesn't even have to last for more than a few seconds. You'll get lots of reports. And in fact, there was one in September and there were over a hundred reports and the longest ones were, they said about 20 seconds is how long they saw it. Uh, and it was seen in Norway and Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands and, and the UK and lots and lots of reports. Uh, that's a pretty typical fireball. This one they do believe was an earth grazer that they saw in Europe and they see a lot of those and also re-entries uh, when every time a, a piece of a satellite or a rocket body re-enters, there'll be many reports if it's a clear night. Well, this was a clear night, so I thought there would be many, many reports and there was not a single one. So I said, well, let's look on some of the other websites. Um, but NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, which runs the geosynchronous GO satellites, they have a lightning detector, a very, very good lightning detector on the newer satellites. Uh, they found pretty early on that they could use that to detect fireballs. And they actually produce a fireball data product. And they update it every couple of weeks. And I figured, well, that should be on there, right? Nothing. So I was, I completely struck out uh, trying to find any trace of anybody else seeing this thing uh, as a fireball either entering the atmosphere or sk just skimming the atmosphere and, and exiting out, which is uh, rare, but it has happened. Uh, there was one in 1972 called the Great Daylight Fireball that was filmed and photographed by a lot of people and seen by hundreds of people. Um, it left a big smoke trail that went hundreds of, hundreds of miles long smoke trail and it entered the atmosphere, dipped to, I think it got us down around 60 kilometers altitude, and then went back out. Spectacular event, but very little doubt about what it was. This one was longer in duration than any fireball that's been seen since then. It, we, we know it was a minute, six seconds plus, and he said roughly 10 seconds. So we'd estimate it was roughly a minute and 16 seconds from horizon to horizon. 
I, if I do my best efforts, I can find no evidence on the video for a smoke trail. And nobody else saw it. He said he described it as a bluish white, which would not be that rare. Uh, but meteors and space debris come in, all, come in lots of different colors. You get green ones, you get orange ones. Um, if it's going through and it's very, very high temperature, it, it could be, it could go to white. Uh, it, most of these meteors, by the way, break up and you can see them breaking up, but the, the earth grazers generally don't break up. The one that they saw in Europe recently did not break up. Uh, it's just too high in the atmosphere. It doesn't, doesn't disintegrate completely. So uh, that hypothesis, I think, is kind of not doing too well. Uh, and everything else that I can come up with fails on several points. Uh, the helicopter idea, the aircraft idea, um, drone. Um, the guy is an amateur drone pilot. He's seen a few drones. He, I don't think he'd be easily fooled by them. But the light, this thing is so bright from the time he starts filming to when it gone it would have to keep a light trained on him which doesn't doesn't really fit any model i have uh, and he did actually this witness is a really good witness he contacted the local police and the local highway patrol they didn't have a helicopter in the area um there's nothing on flight radar 24 you know, so it would have to be military or a drone. But if it's a drone, it's behaving. It's incredibly bright and uh, not behaving much like a drone. It just flew. It flew by in a very, uh, you know, very. It, it may it may look like it's turning in the video, but it's really not turning. It's it's going across the sky in a fairly uh, well behaved way. To me, it looks like it's at high altitude. But since nobody else saw it, I got to figure. It's not that high altitude. So the bolide theory is uh, the earth grazer theory. Our earth grazer is very high. It's like 60, 70 kilometers up there. It's way up there. People can see it from a long way off. And uh, it was not cloudy. And people should have seen it. I went through that video and I identified stars at each phase of the movement. So I know exactly which stars it passed by. And in fact, one time it seemed to go almost right over another uh, identified star. And that's where I looked for the smoke trail. I wanted to see if when the light from the star reappeared, if there would be any evidence that it brightened slowly or dimmed because of, of smoke. And I couldn't find it. So that's where we, that's where we are on that one. Uh, I'm going to continue looking for more information um, and I'm still hoping that some kind of camera will will turn up uh, but it certainly did not have the kind of evidence you get when there's a big fireball I don't know uh, where to take it from there I think we're probably going to close it as unidentified um, and uh, by the way one of the best witnesses we've had in a while The only other case I really think I'll, I'll talk about right now, and there, there's there's a bunch of them. I know you've got cases too, uh, is the uh, the lady in uh, San Francisco. This is more of an historical case, but it's a fascinating, what I would call a close encounter one, a CE1. It's a single witness case, and, and we'll be writing this case up soon. Uh, there's really not a whole lot we can do. There was, it, it was but it was a, a rectangle case, which, I have a personal fascination with. And uh, she saw the rectangle coming down from the sky. This was basically downtown San Francisco. I had been looking sort of kitty corner, uh -huh. like a little bit off, to, a little bit off to my right at this building, uh -huh. where that where I saw the one light, um, and then you know I had been checking it out. And then I, I guess I turned back left to look toward my truck, but for some reason I cocked my head up toward the sky, up left to my left, and that's when I saw um, the star come down and turn into a um, rectangle, or not turn into, but then it, then I realized it was a rectangle as soon as it got closer. 
Okay, now first you so the first time you saw it, it looked like a just a a, light, a single light source. Exactly, a tiny little uh, uh, a twinkling white light source. Okay, about how long did it take to come down mm-hmm. and, and become? Uh, you know, I haven't thought about that. Um, you know, I really don't know, but it was quick. I maybe thirty seconds. Okay. Max, I thought it was coming in a straight line, um, as if it was like slanted. The line was slanted. It was twirling. Twirling. So it was rotating about yeah. maybe its long axis or something? Yes, exactly. Okay. Now, your picture that you put in here, the Photoshop, is actually really mm-hmm. helpful. Uh huh. So quite close? Yeah, very, 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 very close. I feel like the picture is super accurate. But you said you got binoculars to look at it. Uh, yeah, I had the binoculars already. Okay, that's right. Yeah, you already been. So, looking. You've been looking at uh, something yeah, else. Yeah, I had already. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. You couldn't see any details on the surface, just but you saw. Four. No, and I really tried. I really tried. I wanted to see something, yeah. you know, other than just the black um, rectangle. But I don't remember seeing. I thought I saw something, but I just, I honestly can't jog my memory what it might have been. I thought I saw a texture. Um, and I think in my MUFON report, I might have reported texture. But now um, I've tried really hard to remember. And I, I have zero memory of seeing any texture. All I have memory of is seeing black. Yeah, you can see and light. the white light. Yeah, you can see lights, but they weren't illuminating the rest of the. Yeah, there were four white lights, one on each corner. I think, I, I don't know if I put made a picture of that, but one on each corner. And it wasn't like the lights were beaming. It was, they were just, they were just on the craft. Now, it hovered there for a while. Did you, you did, how long was, yeah. was it there? The whole thing was at least 10 minutes, okay. I guess. Uh, and I, I was um, I was absorbing everything like this, like witnessing a miracle, sort of like that, mm-hmm. like completely one hundred percent absorbed. I had no thoughts whatsoever to go get my husband or scream or you know wake him up. Okay. I felt like anything that I did other than observe would be a terrible distraction from what I was seeing. And then you say it. Uh, after hovering there for a while, it, it went horizontal. Is that how would you describe it? So as it was there, um, then it sort of lifted up, sort of, I guess you would describe, like levitated up a little bit uh-huh. and then flattened out like a flying carpet, you know, it like flattened out and then it sort of jumped. I, I always remember it sort of like, sort of like skipping air, like making a little hop, like over a wave. Huh. And then rose up um, over the structures um, that were in its path. So you, you lost sight of it when it just it just flew horizontally away from you. Right. There was no way I could see. You said it went, um, over, it went far over the, off, that far off in the distance. It went over the off ramp um, towards the financial district. Yeah, that's why I jumped so quick to get on Facebook. I was, you know, I was shocked. But then I thought, well, maybe someone's awake. You know, maybe someone could go outside and look. I mean, nothing like this had ever happened to me. And, and so I was just so kind of excited and thought someone else can see it. And I, so I made the post. So after it happened, I did my own. I was literally obsessed about this. Um, I did research like for rectangle craft sightings on every database that I could, mm-hmm. you know, access. And I think I might have seen a couple in the general Northern California area maybe even three, as many as three. Um, but what I've learned throughout this whole process is that even if you do find people that have seen what something similar, there, there's no end result where you get the answers that you think you're looking for. I mean, big answers. I mean, like, what was that? Like, I, I'm almost, I'm pro, actually, I'm really close to the point of feeling that I will probably never know. And in the early days, I felt like I definitely am going to know. I'm going to find out. This is crazy. I have to find out. The incident in 2014 was so profound to me um, because it was so unbelievable to me. And I really don't have any agenda whatsoever except just to share it. 
Yeah. Now I can't do a whole lot with that one because it's so old. Uh, I did find I did find another case on MUFON that had a similar shaped object that was within that same proximate time frame. But I don't uh, I don't have any more information than that. And of course, I don't know how the investigation turned out. We can only look up the reports from MUFON and not not the uh, not the case file. But it's a fascinating triangle case. Uh, not triangle, rectangle case. Uh, she seemed to me very credible. I, as I pointed out, this happened, although it was in the wee hours of the morning, it was in downtown San Francisco. And uh, it seemed to be almost like a little performance for her benefit. Now, I'm not trying to put forth a, uh, a theory. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what it, that just my subjective impression. And uh, yes, and they're almost always single witness cases. And I have one like that myself that I may have talked about before. But the point is that uh, the fact that she was indoors the whole time and there was no apparent physical interaction with, with the object, um, it was high strangeness given those constraints, uh, CE1. And uh, it flew away and she never saw it again. So uh, interesting case. Like all the other single witness cases, though, it's a pretty small piece of the puzzle, if at all, because we just have no way to corroborate it. This is API Case Files. Case files. Well, I've, um, I just closed out a case in Tennessee that I'd been working on for a while. This occurred in East Nashville on July 10th, around uh, 11, 17, and that's central time. Um, I closed it as undetermined because I did not have enough information, although it could have been a drone there was no thing that that led me to that uh, with any sense of satisfaction. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, it could be a drone. Well, it could have been a drone. But there was another very similar case that had been reported to New Fork a night before that that occurred in the same area that this man had been seeing lights for a while. He saw this blinking red light high above him to the east. It caught his eye when he was out smoking a cigarette. Well, I was sitting on my porch that night, and I was uh, just outside smoking a cigarette, and I was facing kind of south, and I just looked up because something, something blinked that caught my eye, and it was like in between like two, uh, I don't know if they were planets or whatever, but there was like a red light that would blink every now and then. And it would fade out, and it would blink on and off again. And uh, so I come in and got my phone camera and went back out. And I pointed it up where it was still going. And uh, on the screen of the camera, it was like three little red uh, dots in a triangular shape. So I just snapped a couple of pictures, like right in a row of it. And then that's what come out what I sent you. With, with my eyes, I only seen like one red dot that would blink and it would like almost fade. Uh, then it would fade completely out after it blinked a couple of times and come back on and blink again. I seen the same thing night before last, but right after that, it seemed like a, either a, like a shooting star or like a, you know, something like that come across almost in the same area. So it might have been something to do with that. I don't know for sure. The the red light I was seeing with my eyes, they were staying like stationary and they weren't blinking consistently. I was looking south and it would have been toward the east because I thought it might be like a jet or something real far up. But when I seen it, I was like, well, I had never seen a jet be that far up. Because, I mean, to me, it looked like it was right there in between, like, these two stars or whatever. I'm talking, it was way up. It just kind of disappeared. And it did the same thing the night before last when I seen it. I seen it again. I thought, well, I, I'm not going to worry too much about it. And I watched it, and it did the same thing. It would blink a couple of times, and then it would fade out, and it would come back up and blink. It was always right at the same position in between the two stars. 
Then last night, I noticed that there was like a, like a shooting star that just come and almost come straight down just right in front of it. And then I didn't see it again. When I did my investigation, other than finding a, a very close, similar report by another person um, to the east of him, I did find that there were three areas in East Nashville where you could fly a drone at night, and it was under a G-class flying status, which means it doesn't have to stay under a 400-foot ceiling, that drones can fly at night up to about 1,200 feet. But if you're going to have a drone flying at night and you want to be legal, then you have to have special lighting on it. And so it had to have night lighting, and night lighting is going to be a, a steady or a blinking white or red light. Uh, so this could have been a drone, and it was um, less than three miles away. All three of these drone flying sites that can fly for 1,200 feet were less than three miles away. So night lighting has to be visible for three miles. So it was. It may have been relatively dim. And at that point, you probably would not have heard rotors three miles away from a little um, drone. And some of these drones are are just about prosumer types. They aren't simple little drones. They can, they can do some stuff. But this wasn't doing flip-flops or anything. It seemed to just kind of be hovering in a portion of the sky doing not much. So lots of times... Drones will do maneuvers, or they're up there taking photographs, and they'll maneuver along a portion of the sky or the cityscape. So it it had some aspects of a drone, some aspects that weren't, and I just could not assign a drone to it. I felt there was insufficient concrete evidence, so I just had to close this as undetermined. Um, so that was a case in in Tennessee, I had another similar case in Georgia that I'm working on that I think is possible could be a drone too. Um, and in Georgia, there were several reports of similar incidences and one report definitely of a drone that seemed to inhibit an aircraft flying over the area, Winterville, Georgia, which is just east of Athens, Georgia. So there is aspects of this sighting that happened um, April 24th and had been going on through mid-July. Intermittent sightings of this object from April through mid-July. Um, back when the COVID first started, we just technically worked from home. And a friend of mine that I hadn't talked to in a while had said he'd been seeing UFOs and all that kind of stuff, and it's pretty regular for him. And uh, he told me some of the stories, and they've got actually a place where they can see the whole sky. And um, we were talking about it. Well, at nighttime, usually about 9.30, 10 o'clock-ish, I'll come out and sit on the back deck, and this one time, after I talked to him, I was like, well, let me look. And the video that I sent in with my report, that was the very first time, and it was close enough to where I could actually see the ground lights and it was strobing on the side. The side you could see, it would be white, but it'd be blinking real, real fast, and then it would flip to green, and blink real, real, real fast, and then it would go to red, and that's basically what I could see. Now, it was totally stationary, and I only seen one at this time in the sky that night, but my wife had taken the dog out the last time in the evening, and when she walked up the driveway, which is basically east, From where I saw it, he saw it in the eastern sky, and I'm basically looking at the northwestern sky off the back of my deck. And I tried to take a videotape of it, but it was far enough away to where you could only see it flashing. But I could see the the colors very 
clearly as they kind of went around in different circles and stuff. And that's about as detailed as I could see it. That recording you sent was April 24th. Right. Okay. So now you took the recording that night and your wife also saw it that night or another date shortly thereafter? After that, I, I actually, you know, really, you could see it so well. The very first night I went and actually got my wife out of her chair and got her and she came out and, and witnessed it too. All right. From then on, every night I'll come out Usually about the time it gets dark, about the time you can see stars in the sky, even if it's, uh, you know, a late dusk or whatever. And I'll come out, you know, an hour at a time or whatever. And I've been doing this. And on clear nights when there's no overcast or anything, I can usually see at least one. But I have noticed that strategically distanced across the sky, there's like, it can be up to four or five of them that I've counted at certain times. But like last night, I could see it. But sometimes they're close enough to where you can see a little detail. And other times, they're, it's like they're so far away, it's like a star. Even though if they're real far away, you can still see it strobing because it will be white. And then it'll strobe the green and then the red. And, and that's what I see and i just had a pair of binoculars you could see a little bit but you had really the handshaking the trying to hold it steady was so bad you really couldn't make that much detail but um i've been seeing it basically every night that i come out and look for it and that's i mean at least five nights out of uh out of a week um it's not always in the same location I have seen it, you know, in other locations, um, southwestern in the sky, and then sometimes it's a little bit northern western in the sky. And um, it's, it, it, I called, uh, I got uh, a friend that works at the airport, and I described it to him, and he was like, well, it might be a drone. And I was like, most drones are battery-powered. And, you know, they're not going to stay up in the sky more than probably two or three hours. And these things go on pretty much, you can see them pretty much all through the night. The different lights on it, it's all kind of, it's like, it's just strobing is all you can really see because it's so far away. But you can tell it's changing colors in my eye, but not in the video. All night long, they are stationary. They do not move about. You see them in the sky, and that's where they stay that particular night. Right. And and they are always at different cardinal directions. Sometimes it'll be in the north sky, sometimes in the east, sometimes in the southeast, you're saying? Uh-huh. Are you certain that these are not twinkling stars? No. The twinkling stars that I have seen my life, I guess, have been, they twinkled, you know, they would get brighter or dimmer or whatever like that, twinkling, but they never change colors like this. And you can see it kind of in a, a rotation manner of the, the, the strobing of the lights. When the, like I said, the first time I saw it, I could really identify the lights. It wasn't like motorized going around in a circle. It would kind of, you know, sit on one color and then go to another color. And then it might go back to the first color and then go to the third color, you know. On the face of it, when one first hears your story, the thought is that you are going mm -hmm. through a typical human illusion and we get this all the time where people see twinkling stars it's called stellar scintillation and the eyeball is making it kind of bounce around and that's autokinetic illusion but um mm -hmm. i don't know that this is that because of the video snippet of yours that i drilled into so I'm thinking there may right. be something there if you can try to get another real good lockdown, high-quality camera piece. Mm -hmm. Now, I have noticed, I, I, I 
something just popped in my head while you were talking. I have noticed that planes have flown by it, being either below it sometimes or above it. And I, you got to understand, I was in the Navy and I was a, uh, I was worked on jets, and and I know the difference between like a plane. Even though now they're starting to use strobe light, they're pretty. Uh, well, they're moving for one thing in a straight line, and these devices just sit kind of in one area. I guess would be the best way to describe it. But and Atlanta Airport is about sixty miles, and a lot of planes fly through my sky throughout the night and stuff like that. And um, but but you can tell it's very obvious in the difference between yeah. the objects and the planes and stuff that are flying by. I contact the cops on both of these cases and there was nothing reported to the police. Um, and I got a little bit from New Fork and a little bit from the local news that there had been a case of a of a interloping drone that was reported to the police. And then I also found a report of a woman who reported to the police she saw a UFO over her place. Uh, and that was a year earlier in essentially the same area as this guy. I'm kind of a kind of a conspiracy theorist. And, you know, I'm even because the way they're strategically placed, and I'm like, is this a new type of uh, a monitoring system the government has that nobody knows about and it's playing itself off as like a star or something like that, you know. But that's just a, a, a wild thought. I, 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 I've been thinking, you know, trying to figure out what this was. Well, I'll tell you, it's, you know, like 99% sure they are not geosynchronous satellites. And um, we do not, we don't have satellites except geosynchronous that are stationary. They, they don't really, I don't think they have that capability yet. Uh, but if they are standing still for hours, it is not somebody's play toy drone. Mm -hmm. And an on-station drone, you know, like they fly over in Iraq and Iran and such, uh, they don't just, they aren't stationary either. They right. just cover an airspace over and over. They circle around, but they don't hover. Not for four right. hours, but the United States government cannot surveil U.S. citizens in the United States of America. Right. So I don't think it's okay. that. I mean, they could. What the hell? Anything okay. could be going on. But just eliminating some of the more obvious, um, I am left at this point puzzled because I don't think it is twinkling stars mm -hmm. and autokinetic right. uh optical illusion right. by the human simply because of that piece of video right. you sent me uh, and right. so I, I gotta get a little more information on this because I don't like to close something as unidentified until I chew on it real long and real hard had a really good case in California and this is an interesting thing about people's psychology and it seems like when some people have a bent towards UFOs everything they see is an anomalous object and certainly in the case of this California um, report at least two of the three things this man reported as certain UFOs have already been completely and easily proven. One aspect of it was he saw a, a light that just over the hills of Azusa, California, where there's been a lot of wildfires. I think that was a, um, a drone, and I haven't gotten the uh, fire station to get back to me yet. That's the only loop of those three aspects of that case I haven't closed. This took place on um, September 22nd and it was six o'clock at night. This um, was a sighting of the light, and he said as he was videotaping it, he saw this object come from the mountain and do a loop-de-loop -loop and zoom off into space, and it that object was pretty clearly 
an, an insect that flew out of the darkness and was captured by the camera. And then because it was dark out, it bloomed that image and it made a tracer on it and made it fuzzy. But that was just an insect that came into contact of the lens capturing device and then left the lens capturing device into the dark again. So that was pretty much debunked. And he also said he saw and captured that same day an object that another woman that was just to the west of him captured and put on a Facebook full video of this object. And I looked at it and it was difficult to tell what that was. But my witness said he captured that same object in that very footage I was looking at. So I went to Flight Radar 24, looked at the exact time, and there was firefighting equipment that was flying helicopters. And um, U.S. Forest Service was flying planes that were dropping fire retardant, and I tracked that exact plane on the exact movement that he captured a, vi a bit in his video. So I was able to determine that that was just an airplane. And the, the point is that this guy was so heightened, he belongs to a Facebook group about UFO sightings. And this Facebook group is just people throwing up UFO sightings. There is no critical talk about anything on it. So this is a case of where some people are so caught up in this that everything they see, critical thought is not even entertained, and they go right with UFOs. I run into that every once in a while. The last one, the last email when I sent him that I, of the three objects, I've determined two of them, and I haven't heard back from him since, because I don't think he wanted to hear that. This is API Case Files. Case files. One other one I want to talk about was one I got from Estonia. This was a, a sighting on August 23rd, and uh, this object caught on a frame of his camera in a still shot that he shot raw photo capture of that and Paul's taken a look at that now and he determined that thing is about 20 meters long. If it's 20 meters and that's how far away it is and so on but a pretty typical size for an aircraft a, a good size aircraft. Uh-huh okay. So um, yeah we don't know what it is. Well uh, I, I think it's I think it's a, a Russian T-50 that well, is flying around uh, the up only there, place but... way that would be if it was out over the Gulf of Finland or somewhere out in the water that's right due north of Tallinn, right yeah, due north. Yeah. So I, I sent an email, so hopefully he'll get back to me. And, and one of the problems, you know, we got two new investigators. We got Molly and we got Dan. And one of the things I was telling them during our training session is that a lot of times people will share their story because they want to tell you about it. And they say, yeah, they want an investigation, not understanding what it will entail. It's going to entail back and forths. And lots of times these people who report a sighting and contend that they want a um, investigation are gone after the first question. They just, they just vaporize and will not get back with you. And you end up having what could be a really good case that you have insufficient data to build an investigation on and you have to close it as due to lack of witness response. I hope this one doesn't go that way, but many of them do. And um, it's kind of disheartening. There's a fair amount we have to close as uninvestigated due to lack of witness response. At any rate, I know you and Molly are working on a case out of Japan that is a quirky one. Yeah, I don't know what to think of that one. <laughs> uh, Molly, you want to talk about that case? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting case. It was a video of sort of a blue flash in the sky, and the video that I saw magnified the image, and it looked <clears throat> almost like there were two objects. Uh, one of them was like a parallelogram with the wide side up, and then there was sort of an object off to the left of it a little bit. And I happened to be reading another book, and they had mentioned that they had seen a blue flash in the sky, and the other book said that um, air, airplane refueling, like air refueling tankers, use blue lights, and they're the only aircraft that does. Because I'm sort of approaching it from, you know, what could it possibly be? And 
So blue light, maybe air fueling tanker. Uh, and Paul pointed out that maybe we would see that light for a longer period of time, but maybe if they had just finished refueling an airplane and it pulls away, maybe there's some sort of blue flash that you'll see. Uh, so I think it's a really, and I thought it was interesting, Paul, that you had mentioned that the light that you were working on, um, that first case you were talking about, had a blue tinge to the light. It doesn't sound like it was really bright blue, the way that this one looked in the video, but I don't think that blue is a really common color, maybe. Um, so I thought it was interesting that they both had a sort of blue to it. Yeah, well, that same case, I think is the other video he has shows a red light. So <laughs> he, apparently he goes to this beach, which is um, east of Tokyo, and just sets up his camera. And wasn't the video uh, just a real short, short sequence of it, though? It was just very, very short. Oh, yeah, the one frame or two frames. The one I, the video I saw was where they had put together um, sort of an analysis more, and they sort of stopped at that at the, at the flash and then zoomed in and had a still frame of the object that was zoomed in. Did you see that one, Marsha? No, I, I didn't see that. I just recall that this, that you guys. Well, he, he, sent, he sent me the actual original video as requested um and i had it took me a long time <laughs> to find where the flash was it was so so brief he had to tell me where it was in the frame or i never would have found it and it's not terribly bright but it is clearly there and it's a very very short duration so um don't know what to make of that it doesn't seem to be anything astronomical or uh it's not conventional aviation. Um, maybe something else. I don't know. We, uh, you know, we had that uh, case in Vietnam earlier this year where a gentleman saw a an irregularly flashing red light and got very good video of it. Um, that one was the movement of it was not at all odd. It was, it was, uh, you know, just. But it, it just went going back and forth in the sky and, and not very fast. But Are drones even allowed over there? Uh, well, actually, the answer to that question was no. But it might, be, it might be police drones or government drones. I don't know much about modern-day Ho Chi Minh City. <laughs> I was told by more than one person that drones are no longer allowed there. They used to be when they were, when they were new. But the government has banned them. Yeah. Uh, we ruled out an airplane pretty quickly. Uh, ruled out a lot of things, but it was a it was a flashing red light, and and it was an irregular flash, which is something that we've been seeing more of lately. These kinds of irreg these lights that flash at irregular intervals. Yeah, we go to drones an awful lot, but it is just kind of a catch-all, easy thing, and and it could very well be that drones um, account for far more than we realize. But you know, Molly, when we were talking about the Japan case, about just a very, from what I understand, a very brief blip of blue light. Remember I'd sent you that thing about the 22nd Air refueling wing? They fly out of the Pacific and, and they are, you know, they're a black operation and they do all their refueling lights out. And right. the planes that come up, the, the aircraft, uh, the fighters that come up with them when they're on a mission, and I would suppose they do a lot of practice missions that close to North Korea, then they would do blacked out conditions. And, and I postulated, well, you know, maybe the somebody on one of those aircraft hit their lights quickly and said, oh, no, this isn't supposed <laughs> to be on. <laughs> but you wouldn't see... Uh, um, you wouldn't see these 22nd air refueling wing flying Sorry. in the sky when they do their business and they're on a stealth lighting mission. So, it, right. and we'll never find out if that was it. The, the, that's never going to happen. We'd never know if that was what happened. Would they be that close to mainland Japan though? And, and I mean, a very busy, a very busy aviation area. I know they fly uh, right out of Yokota air base. There's, um, you know, it's a big Pacific base, Yokota. And uh, it certainly was when I was there in the 80s. So it's a very busy 
Air Force Base, and they fly missions out, and they fly over Korea. They fly a lot around there in the Pacific. They would be also, if they're flying, you know, if it's if it's the refueling thing, they would be pretty high up, probably higher than a flight path to an airport. Well, not necessarily. They often will, part of their procedures for stealth refueling is very low refueling. And again, I'm, they are capable of that. They're the only stealth uh, KC refueler that I know of, the 22nd. And they do very low um, and slow, too, because they, you know, they um, refuel C-130s and such. And C-130 gunships are very, very important, even though they're very old. So it's a possibility it was that, but it's not like we're ever going to find out if that was a blip accident by one of the refuelers or one of the fighters that were being refueled. Well, the argument against an accident would be that they had seen this light more than once, I think, right? Didn't they see it, you know, a year ago and then they saw it again? We saw a different light uh, of flash. And I, I don't know if he has more more data or, or uh, you know, why he started doing those videos. I, I don't know. We need- well, he's he's a UFO investigator in Japan. He is... Um, He's his own man, and he does UFO investigations in Japan. And so, to my mind, it could possibly be a case of where you're going to find UFOs if you're looking for UFOs. And so you see a, an anomalous light in the sky, and your mind just spends no time on critical thinking. Well, Z- but, you know, it's an unusual light. It's blue. You know, you don't see the flash in more than once, you know, so it's obviously not like regular airplane lights. He's He's shooting videos all the time i i don't know if if every time it you know we haven't seen all of his videos they might be prosaic there might be perfectly good explanations they might not be there's always a chance that it truly is an anomalous you know um interdimensional object that he captured it it could be it's certainly within the realm of possibility it's highly improbable but it's possible and and that's what we're talking here is these things that are highly improbable are being thrown out there as who investigate this thing. Not that I'm complaining. It's fun to investigate. It's just that it's part of the psychological makeup of a lot of things that we get sent to us to look at. But if that's highly improbable, it's also pretty improbable that a pilot flying over Japan would make a mistake two times and flashes, you know, cockpit light by accident twice. In the same video? Well, no, in the, the like, no. assume that you've seen, like, the, the, the flash, like, that's, several, you know, a year apart or whatever, so. Those were different yeah, videos, well, different objects, different times. They're different videos. Uh, they're, I think they were taken in the same place, or nearly the same place. Um, he goes to, he goes to this, this place uh, occasionally, and he just sets up his camera and shoots, and uh, I don't know what motivated that initially. Clearly, you know, the fact that it wasn't in the center of the frame, he wasn't looking for it being there. It showed up. Yeah, so he only saw that one particular thing, Molly, that we got on video. He only saw that once. But he has seen other anomalous lights of different types and different durations before. But he just submitted that one. Well, there's not much we can do with it, frankly. I mean, it's, it's uh, unless, unless there's some pattern that we can find with other similar flashing lights. Uh, what happened to your postulation that it might just be a camera glitch? How can you, can you? I, well, I wouldn't, I, uh, he did actually investigate that himself. Uh, he took the camera to the manufacturer. Uh, I still think that's not wildly a- improbable. It, it could be some kind of error in the camera uh, that caused it, but I don't have a good hypothesis for exactly what that would error would have been um because you know i do a lot of photography and i don't see stuff like that uh, but maybe i'm just not looking close enough well anything is possible many things are highly probable and a lot of things are highly improbable which makes this a fun gig You've already done your first case, Molly, which turned out to be a uh, sighting of Starlink. That was a pretty good case, right? Yeah, it was really interesting. I think 
the witness was actually really poetic. He kind of evoked the um, feeling of the vastness of space, and he was looking at the stars, and it was cold in the morning. It was really nice to read his story. And even though it was Starlink, it was still sort of just really a connection with, with the uh -huh. upper atmosphere. Yeah, it was an awesome sight for him, and it really rocked his world. And I don't know if in the end he was appreciative that we knew exactly what it was, or if it took some of the, the awe out of it for him. Yeah, but... That's where the data leads. <laughs> That's right. That's where the data leads. So sorry, witness. That's what it was. But yeah, that was a, that was a pretty good case. And uh, that was your first case. And, and now you're working on this Japan case with Paul. And you'll probably right. get another um, case to go on relatively soon. So that'll be exciting. Cool. That'll be a nice way to close out the year. This is API Case Files. Case Files. And that brings us to the end of episode 16 of API Case Files. I've been your host, Marsha Barnhart, and I was joined by my colleagues, API Director Paul Carr and new API investigators, Dan and Molly. We discussed a lot of cases during this episode. The report of investigation, or ROI, on many of our completed cases can be accessed at our website, aerial-phenomenon.org. Just select Investigations on the drop-down menu. I've also included links to some of the case file visuals we discussed here on this program's show notes. We provide video case synopses of some of our past cases. If you're interested in looking at that, go to our API Case Files YouTube channel for that and much more. podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. Links in the show notes for this episode can be found at apicasefiles.com. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. All music heard on this podcast is licensed under Creative Commons. This free use with attribution music is deeply appreciated, and we thank the musicians and songwriters for sharing their creative spirit. Featured during this episode was music by Ergo Fizmiz, Scott Buckley, Rain Sleep, Scott Holmes, Biggie, and Ketza. Our introduction theme music is a mashup of Alien Chronicler and Boxcat Games, and DJ Spooky provides this outro theme music you're listening to. Visit our website at aerialphenomenon.org and find out more about our organization. And you can make a UFO report at this site. Just fill out the form provided as completely as you can, and that will generate a report. You can also make a UFO report to us at www.aerialphenomenon.org reportaufo.org Meanwhile, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this show, and we hope you recommend API Case Files and our companion podcast series, API Conversations, to your friends and acquaintances. This is API Case Files. Case Files. Case Files.